Well, there we are. It is the final day. God damn, I forgot to do the day count. Uh, uh, hold on, let me get up and fucking day count it. One second, that would drive me crazy. All right, it's about that time. All right, so today, I believe, is the final uh, episode of Space Shards. Believe it or not. Um, so uh, what do we got right here? Who needs to know that this is going on? Well, let's let Not Math know. Let's let uh, MDE know. I let LRH know. I let Teams for Christ know. Who else do I tell? I, I manually link this every damn day. Uh, I'm going to let the, the Jenks server know, let's let Pound Sally know, and then we have some Discord servers that we're affiliated with. First the LRH Discord, hell yeah. Uh, then we got the Joe Rogan Experience, hell yeah. These are good Discords, by the way. If you just want somewhere to chat, we are truly out here, truly blessed. And then the final uh, episode in Real Politics, and then uh, just because I can do it, it's the last... Uh, hip hop one. Hell yeah, we out here. All right, so I want to shout out to uh, everybody who has been with us through this whole thing. Uh, we will probably have like a long editing session today, which uh, makes me wish that I uh, didn't drink quite so much rum yesterday. But uh, yeah, you, you know, kind of goes hand in hand with the whole uh, writing thing. Uh, a life of uh, degenerate alcoholism. <laughs> I think we're back on. Uh, uh, Facebook today. I, it turned out that our API token for Facebook had expired, so uh, none of my homies on Facebook were seeing this pop up. If that was you, I'm deeply sorry. Uh, so I'm going to give a rundown. Since it's the last day, uh, I'm going to give a rundown of what has happened, the story thus far, and uh, we're going to get down to it. One thing we do do is uh, every morning uh, I pull three tarot cards and let everybody know what the future holds for today. Uh, I want to see what uh, the reading was for yesterday, because Yesterday was a hectic fucking day for me, man. Let me tell you, I, uh, I should have paid attention to them cards a little bit better. All right, let's see uh, what's going on here. So first, we have a new author's note uh, that's going to be part of the preface for the piece. And it says, author's note. This book deals with issues of developmental disability in a way that is intended to be humorous and uplifting. My aim is to portray the characters as heroic figures with hopes, dreams, and feelings, even if they are Marines. <laughs> Oh, 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 I love it. <laughs> oh, that does exactly the lifting that we need for an author's note about a book named Space Tards. Um, so what do we got right here? Uh, we got these here cards. Uh, and let's pick three. And let's get a closer gander. Hell yeah. Yeah, we have <laughs> we have a pretty budget studio set up here. This is all just shit I cobbled together, man. Uh, if you could see what it looks like in here, uh, you would be astonished at the uh, level of uh, pigger rigging as the Marines like to call it. But let's take a look right here. All right, so um, this is a very um, solid choice for a seven. 
Uh, this is somebody looking at the fruits of his crops. I'm just taking a moment to reflect on what he has accomplished right here. Uh, and it's very much focused on the fruits of his labors. Well, today we are going to finish uh, this very, it's like a 30,000 word story at this point. It's uh, 29,747 uh, words, uh, which is pretty, it's pretty considerable. That's a good, uh, that's a good length of story right there. It would probably take me about an hour and uh, maybe an hour and some change to read it aloud, maybe closer to like two hours. So that's not too bad. So we have the page of cups uh, right here. Uh, so the page of cups, again, is uh, kind of a time for reflection as well. Uh, he is uh, staring into the fish in his cup, not perturbed, not upset. Uh, though the seas behind him are tumultuous, he stands upon the firmament. He's not going anywhere as he uh, reflects on his cup. And then uh, finally, we have strength, which is uh, using the power of civility to tame uh, your inner nature, right? And uh, as I look upon this whole thing, I can't help but think uh, that uh, uh, this is a pretty fitting spread that we've pulled right here. I definitely get kind of reflective and moody at the end of uh, any uh, creative piece. Uh, generally because they don't do well after uh, I release them. And uh, a lot of this editing is about taking that uh, wild inner nature, that your desire to just put crazy shit in at all times and write in all caps and have amazing things and uh, forcing yourself to uh, civilize your writing a little bit, uh, to justify some of your decisions, to think about how others will take uh, some of the things that you've done and uh, to really uh, consider uh, how it's all gone down. So uh, I'm pretty happy about uh, this spread. It seems relevant, and I just realized that I didn't get water, so uh, you have a few seconds to gander at this and ponder yourself. How could these cards apply to you? What are what are you harvesting today? Uh, what's on your mind? And uh, how have you been able to tame your inner beast? I'll be right back. Okay, so on the off chance this is the only uh, video that you ever encounter with yours truly right here. I'm uh, Zach ZYZ. I'm a uh, science fiction, fantasy, and just generally a genre writer uh, coming at you live out of Bedford Stuyvesant, home of the livest ones in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time. This is the second book that I've edited on uh, Twitch.tv and all these streams. And uh, we had a really good response to the first one. Um, just in general, people are uh, uh, really chill. I'm a little late uh, for showing up for this one, so it's entirely uh, possible that uh, everybody has fucking already gone to sleep because uh, usually we get a crew of people who are deep in the cut in, like, darkest Africa and uh, brightest India, and I, I have no idea. I don't know how to extrapolate that whole thing, but um, sometimes it's just me, and uh, that's totally fine, too, because it's relaxing when it's just me. Um, but I digress. So this is, this story is Space Tards. Uh, Space Tards is, uh, about a platoon of space marines who, um, have been genetically engineered using tardigrade uh, DNA so that they are highly resistant to radiation so that they're hu superhumanly strong. Uh, there's something like four or five times, uh, the mass of a typical adult male at this time in humanity's development. Uh, but they're, Maybe not the uh, brightest people that you've ever met in your life. They're kind of fucking dumb uh, when all is said and done. Oh, hold on just a second. I think I may have to uh, quit. I probably have to quit out of another session of pages. So yeah, gander at these cards once more. Hold on just a second.
Yeah. So when we see the window uh, jumping all over the place like that, it's because there's another session of pages open uh, somewhere, and um, it's just refreshing to uh, the most common saved copy of it. Because Apple are not the greatest software writers ever to grace God's gay earth. Okay. Uh, so anyhow, um, these are a platoon of 23 Marines, and each of them has a name in this story somewhere. I think one person doesn't quite get his name said, but I think we fixed that. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so there's 23 Marines. Uh, I would describe them as being like relatively squat, kind of dwarf-like, uh, just solid slabs of muscle. They, they, um, they have that, you can see pictures online, of animals where they uh, lack this myostatin inhibitor and they're just covered with uh, bands of muscle. And that would be these guys. They're just totally fucking ripped, ready to go. So in the first chapter, we get to find out a little bit about the Admiral of the HMASS Polybius. All right, hold on. <sighs> His, Her Majesty's Australian Space Service. Um, so, yeah, uh, this is the... Yeah, actually, let's not do Hamas. Oh, yeah. I think Hamas was uh, something that we added in later, um, just as a as a laugh, and uh, it actually works out pretty well. So we're sticking with that. So yeah, here in Chapter 1, we introduce uh, the Admiral of the Polybius, uh, and ideally uh, of some other uh, ships in the whole like fleet. Uh, type situation because you're generally not just an admiral of one boat real talk uh what do we have right here and uh da, 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 da. crew ignored the ai's warning a few of the junior officers allowed grins to spoil the military bearing okay uh so we were pretty happy with that uh with a fair amount of humor it describes uh, the arrival of the whale uh so in this story whales are these alien hulks that appear in a uh, uh, an invisible nova of what's called herald radiation. Uh, so this is one of the primary gimmicks of the story. Herald radiation is uh, like an unsensible, strange radiation that just murders literally every any, every organic entity that you put into it. Any kind of uh, advanced circuitry or any anything more complicated than uh, literally, and even like some batteries and stuff like that just can't withstand this strange radiation that is fully not understood, uh, its action and uh, its source and so forth. But for whatever reason, whales, uh, these alien ships, which are full of all kinds of fantastic technologies like uh, anti-gravity devices and uh, strange mixtures of gases that can harden uh, until they're tougher than steel. Um, there's all these uh, neat alien artifacts, but uh, nobody can get inside of them and you can't send drones or robots to do the work because the radiation will just kill them flat. Uh, which is kind of like an interesting concept here, is it means that all of the technology that these uh, TARDs use has to be analog for the most part. Uh, so they have a lot of uh, little gimmicks that they use to deal with some of the problems of exploring uh, a spacecraft with like variable gravity, where some rooms are uh, have an atmosphere of toxic gas, some rooms are in complete vacuum, and uh, they really don't know because there's a high degree of variability on these crafts. Uh, so we're we're definitely, with the Space Marine concept, we're ripping off uh, Games Workshop as hard as we possibly can. Come at me with your lawyers. I don't, I don't, think, I don't think you own a patent on Space Marines, motherfuckers. Um, but <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, definitely, we, the idea of exploring an alien hulk um, is like a very Space Hulk um, type uh, situation there, which is a fun game if you ever feel like playing it. Um, so we are introduced here to both the Admiral and a character called the Chief of Marines or the Com. And the Chief of the Marines is the interface between the brass of the Polybius and the platoon of uh, uh, Tardigrade Marines. And the Com is a good-natured sort. He's a likable character uh, for the most part. Uh, so in chapter two, uh, in chapter one, uh, they witness the arrival of the largest whale uh, that has ever been seen, ever recorded. In fact, it's so large, it can't quite make it through the breach. The breach uh, struggles to open wide enough to admit it, and then halfway through, just snaps the whale in half, 
and uh, uh, leaves ha like half of the spaceship floating derelict in space. Um, so generally, these whales uh, breach for a specified period of time, and uh, then they slip back into whatever either alternate dimension uh, they're from. And if they're prevented from doing so, they tend to uh, go supernova with the force of like a type uh, uh, 1A star, which, uh, which is bad. You don't want to be near a star when it goes supernova. It will fuck your shit up. It's my experience. Anyhow, maybe, maybe yours is different. So I don't want to be prejudiced against supernovas. Anyhow, um, so things are looking good. Uh, they give the order to send in the tards, which is my favorite, uh, one of my favorite lines right there. And uh, the tards refuse to deploy. Uh, and it turns out the reason why is uh, their pilot has been put in a brig for trying to climb into the ship's reactor. Uh, the tardigrade marines are fascinated with reactors and sources of radiation. Uh, yeah, shouts to Jira. You were the first chat of the day. Um, so they're fascinated with reactors and just feel oddly compelled to get inside of them and hang out. Uh, and like radiation that would kill uh, like an entire city is nothing to these guys. Uh, so no justice, no peace. Uh, I, I guess that's probably true. Uh, in and out of this mid-probation appraisal. What the hell does that mean? Are they going to kick you out of uh, the UK? Or is that like a, um, like you work for some software company and they do everything like it's the fucking Cub Scouts because they don't, uh, because uh, programmers can't be treated like human beings. I think it's probably the latter. Okay, so the Tards refuse to go on the mission without Bonzo. Uh, their pilot, and they, they say they need Bonzo because he is the strongest and the bravest. Um, so the uh, unfortunately, the, the chief of Marines would like nothing better than to blast Bonzo out of the ship uh, from the airlock, uh, but he soon finds himself outmaneuvered in uh, this negotiation because he really does need the tardigrade Marines. They are the only ones that can explore this whale. It's the whole reason why the Polybius is out here. Uh, the Polybius is a whaler designation. All it does is hunt for these ships and try to send space marines into it to steal their technology and to um, loot uh, precious artifacts and so forth and uh, find out research data. Sounds like bureaucracy, which is hella tarded. Uh, and I doubt that they're tardigrade augmented um, there. Uh, but we learned that they have enlarged hyoid, hyoid bones, like they're baboons, so they can shout at three times the volume of a normal human being. And they do it often. They love shouting. Oh, I, I really like these guys. Um, okay, uh, so yeah, Gunny is able to actually win in a negotiation uh, with the Chief of Marines, even though um, Gunny is probably like half the intelligence of the Chief of Marines. Uh, one, one like note about the intended level of uh, intelligence of these characters. Um, the Marines are like sort of borderline retarded in this story uh, by the standards of today. By the standards of, uh, what is this, taking place in like 2054 or something like that? Not 2054, like uh, 2525 or something like that. It's a long way out, right? Because uh, human beings have faster than light travel. Um, uh, but it doesn't have to be that long way out. The only real technology that we posit here uh, are explosives that are uh, significantly in advance of what we have right now and faster than light travel. So this story could take place uh, anytime after we discover uh, faster than light travel. and But there are some significant changes to the society. Uh, so Jira says, when I play D&D, I play stupid brutes just like these chuckleheads. I like chuckleheads. I should work that in somewhere. Okay. Um, so they win that negotiation, and uh, the captain is forced to release Bonzo, even though he almost killed everybody on the Polybius by getting inside of the reactor. <laughs> Who knows what would it, maybe it would have mutated into some like kaiju uh, marine. Um, so this is a chapter, uh, so the next chapter, uh, ba, 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 ba. how deep do we get into this? I think it's a whole chapter with Bonzo in the com. So chapter three is a conversation between Bonzo and the chief of marines. And uh, we start to see that not only is Bonzo the bravest and the wildest, um, he is also a little bit smarter than the average tard. And it has questions about his own morality. And here the, the com has a chance to just lie to him. Uh, because 
Bonzo asks him, yeah, what happens to all the platoons that you led? You know, you've led like 30, they're the 37th platoon. He's like, what happened through to one through 36? 37. My girlfriend led 37 platoons. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and uh, the comm has the opportunity to lie to Bonzo here, but instead he elects to tell them. He's like, listen, you guys are hatched. We keep flying you on missions until you're all dead. And it's the same with me. You know, I was also built for this role. This is all I'll do until one of these whales goes supernova. That's what we're made for. Uh, and what we frankly want to do, you know, like that's, that's what they live for. Uh, so I like, I like this exchange between the two of them. It's where we start to see that Bonzo is something special. And it, um, it shows some characteristics of the chief of Marines that I consider to be a good leader. Uh, the ability to level with people uh, about things where it would be much easier to lie. Because there are a lot of spots where a leader can do the, they can just feed you some bullshit and deal with your problem later. And in this case, he even thinks like, hey, there's a pretty good chance these Marines aren't coming back from this mission. I can just lie here to get them in the boat. But he doesn't do that. He displays some integrity, and I really like it there. Uh, also, there's a lot of gay sex in that scene. Uh, not even fooling around, not between uh, Bonzo and the uh, Chief of Marines, uh, just they're spying, they're like voyeurs on the Admiral, uh, who is fraternizing with his midshipsmen. <laughs> Or one of them, like some ensign is getting railed. Hell yeah. Um, okay, so then we get into chapter four. Uh, chapter four is them loading into the RATS, which is a radiation hardened analog transport spacecraft. This is Marines uh, the world over love uh, fucking acronyms. They, they would do them all day long. And uh, this talks a little bit about some of the gear that they take onto there. Uh, it introduces this concept that each of the Marines has what's called a helmet herald, uh, which is uh, just like a logo or design painted on the back of their helmet so that uh, they can tell each other apart uh, in the dark and uh, uncertain conditions of a whale. Uh, so like uh, Gunny's helmet has a, a picture of his own face. And he's got like a word balloon that says, don't fuck up. Although he says chuck up because in this book, all the profanity uh, is turned into... Um, kind of watered down equivalents that are phonetically similar um, in radioluminescent letters. Hell yeah. Um, and then one of the guys has a, uh, a big flaming pork chop. Uh, another guy has a uh, like phallic serpent flying across a star, star field with wings. Uh, what's one of my favorite? Um, uh, there's a there's one where um, uh, it's a nuclear blast and it says proud of the cloud underneath. Shout out to that high school that that was their actual mascot for a long time. Hell yeah. Before somebody complained. Uh, so we talk about how Bonzo is a hotshot pilot uh, and uh, how the chances that they will all die are 52.78%. Um, <laughs> that's not great. Um, but that's how it is. Um, so here uh, in chapter five, the Marines get onto the whale and... Um, on uh, and they start doing their initial checks. They're able because the whale is ripped in half. They're able to fly their rats uh, directly into a corridor and land it there. And they start trying to find a way into the whale. And what you find is that tards do not know how to open the doors in whales. Uh, this is kind of like a three seashells moment for uh, the tards. Most of the uh, dividers between rooms uh, on whales are like these flat, featureless discs. Uh, made out of thin metal and ostensibly there's a way to just open these things but they have not been able to figure it out in all the whales that they've been on uh, so they're usually reduced to cutting through them with big uh, big saws or bashing them apart with sledgehammers and uh, widening them with crowbars uh, or blowing them open with explosive charges which is what they're trying to do on this whale but as they're about to blow the door uh, Gunny asks uh, one of the marines lefty what he thinks about it, and Lefty tells him he has a bad feeling about the door. And one thing about Lefty is that his hunches are usually right. Um, like there's a little description here about how you can't really bluff him in poker or sneak up behind him and whop him on the back of the head or whatever. He's just got a good uh, sixth sense about him right there. So uh, the captain, or the, um, oh, sorry, the, the main character here is Gunny, their gunnery sergeant. 
And uh, we go a little bit earlier into how well, the Marines are either a Marine or they're a Gunny. That's the only rank distinction that they see between the two of them. Uh, though they're actually grouped into uh, different specialist roles in this. And uh, the gunnery sergeant is sort of in charge of the whole thing. Um, so the gunny has to like kind of dish out the toll chocks and uh, keep people in line for the most part. And like I like the gunny character in this. He, uh, he's a good gunny. Uh, <laughs> so they talk a little bit about this room here. They decide not to blow the door and instead they climb out to the surface of the whale. Uh, and get a little bit into uh, some of the peculiar properties of um, the skin of the whales, which they call ghost skin. Uh, and apparently every whale has a unique pattern of uh, golden lines uh, embedded in the skin of the whale that uh, if you know how to look for them in a specific way, you can find. And this whale has weird patterns. Uh, the, uh, they are triangles arranged in a valknut. Um, which is like a Viking sign uh, that uh, means death. <laughs> or it just it means the afterlife uh, in some ways. It, um, they, uh, you can find these like inscribed on rocks all over the place and fucking places where Vikings are at, like the, uh, their stadium and I guess their, uh, their practice grounds and stuff. Okay, anyhow. So we get a little bit into that. Uh, we talk a little bit about the smarts who are uh, this entirely female uh, case of scientists that uh, make a lot of the decisions that the TARDS then have to deal with. Uh, let's see. Okay, so then we get to chapter six. Oh, uh, so what do they do right there? They, uh, and so in chapter five, I think there are about three separate occasions where TARDS almost kill everybody in the platoon and they haven't even gotten inside of one room yet. Like somebody almost drops a saw on a uh, satchel full of explosive charges. Uh, Bango, their demolitions guy, almost blows up uh, a, uh, a shaft that's full of silane gas that would have just uh, blown maybe the whale in half, and like into the quarters, I guess, at that point. Um, and then Member almost dismembers himself, uh, swinging onto this cluster of vorpal wire. Uh, so you, you get the idea in this chapter shit is going to get real in the course of space tards and indeed it do uh so in chapter six uh they uh this is about them uh beating open this door and getting blasted with silane gas and uh getting into the first teardrop this is a short chapter this is fucking seven or eight uh, it's just like four or five pages this is the shortest chapter in the book and it's just about them um making the decision and uh saving their lives by uh, not blowing the door, because behind it is explosive gas. Silane. Mm -hmm. uh. All right, what do we got here? Uh, they prepare to enter the alien hulk. So in chapter 7, they start exploring the first room, which is a uh, teardrop-shaped room that is kind of like a strange airlock. And we get a little bit into the exploration protocols that they use, when exploring these rooms, um, uh, like scout protocols, and so I think there's more scouting in the next room. Uh, but they talk a little bit about the rudder, uh, which is a uh, literal book that's clipped to uh, their mission recorder member's arm. And uh, Gunny basically is giving these guys a, a lesson. Uh, everything that they teach these guys, they have to repeat it over and over again because they forget so much. Um, and he tells them, that if they bring back the rudder intact, the mission is a success and they all get to nod for a week, which is like they basically just dope these guys up on opium for a week. Uh, but if they fail to bring back the rudder, um, then the mission is a failure and they will all go into what is called the reminder room for maybe months. So um, yeah, we talk, that talks a little bit about the reward structure that they get for exploring these whales that are so dangerous. Um, and, uh, it talks about kind of like an afterlife for them where their actions are recorded in a good book. We talk a little bit about, um, some of the ways that they use to interact with something that they don't understand on a whale. They have a little bit of, uh, and then Gunny, uh, tells a story about a time where he was the sole survivor, uh, of a, uh, mission and where he got so fucked up that he, uh, had to fly back the rats single handed handedly and he crashed it into the ship bay and just killed a lot of humies. Um, uh, how do I remind? Uh, yeah, what do we got there? 
So yeah, Gunny's story is kind of a little bit, we get into um, how Gunny is a real one uh, and just making it through this whole thing. And uh, we, we get across that like whales are very different from each other. Like they encounter all kinds of weird uh, shit on the different uh, ships. Uh, and then there's an altercation between Gunny and Bonzo where Bonzo is mouthing off and Gunny forces him to go and get uh, oxygen tanks for the um, platoon. And Gunny's like, that's not my job. And, or um, Bonzo is like, that ain't my job. And then Gunny is like, it is now. And he stares him down. And Bonzo is uh, forced to relent. Uh, so what happens in the reminder room? Uh, that's where they try to uh, extract as many mission details uh, from these very um, absent-minded and not super smart um, space marines. Uh, so they literally go in there and just try to remind them of what happened and, um, and uh, get as much of an accountability of the mission as they can. And to the tards, it's like torture, uh, right? Like, where were you on the night of such and such? I don't know. Where were you on the night? I don't know. Where were you on the night? I don't know. You know, that kind of, that kind of shit going down. So, uh, yeah, we see a little bit of insubordination hitting Gunny, and he does not take that shit for a second. So in room uh, chapter number eight, uh, they start exploring, I believe, uh, a new room. They, get, they breach another door. And they find a room that is uh, like a tall shaft that they can't see the bottom of the top of. And it's full of glass tubes that are uh, draped from floor to ceiling in uh, like tangles of spaghetti. And at every so often, like a blue spark will drop from the top of the shaft down towards the bottom with this whistling sound. Um, so that's, that's cool. I, I dig that. Um, then... Uh, Let's see. So one thing I'd like to add uh, while we're here. Uh, let's see. Spike puncture. Uh, disorder among the tubes. Gravity in this chamber was oriented. In the direction of the whale's hull. Okay, so that's actually that one line, just where we say the direction that these are falling in, helps us orient um, the whole thing. And uh, possibly in the part where we land the rats, we should say uh, that gravity is oriented towards the hull of uh, the whale. Uh, just because like when we get into uh, later chambers and so forth, it's gonna be important um, and we'll see why. Okay, so they wonder what this is all about. They wonder if it's a networking closet or what it is. Uh, there's like this weird gas exchange uh, between the two chambers. Um, and we start to talk about some of the weaponry that they've brought on this. And it becomes clear to the uh, reader that these Marines are armed to the teeth. They came here expecting a fight. Um, like just about all the Marines that are riflemen have a, um, like the equivalent of like an M15 
uh, or an M16 or something. Like that. I, I think what we have here is an Imer M15S 0G rated machine gun, which they call the Shredder. And uh, then one of their heavy weapons dudes has the uh, Bosch Ordnance Projectile System, a 75 millimeter recoilless rifle they call the Bop Gun. 75 millimeter shell inside of an explosive uh, enclosed space is pretty fucking wild. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't fire a fucking bazooka inside of a spaceship, but Latards have a uh, a higher calling than me. Okay, so they um uh, while they're exploring the shaft, uh, Benny starts to uh, reminisce about um, his favorite weapon, which is strapped to him right now, a uh, YBR uh, seventy three twin jet heavy flamer. Uh, nobody got this joke uh, because it's pretty obscure right here, but uh, YBR stands for uh, Yellow Brick Road uh, 73, which was uh, the release date of Elton John's uh, uh, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road album, uh, which has the song on it, Benny and the Jets. Uh, so that's that's like, that's like uh, only only I will ever enjoy this joke. But to me, that's, that's fucking, uh, his heavy flamer is uh, named after an Elton, Elton John album. <laughs> it's a good song. You know, like, say whatever you want about Elton John, but if you don't like Benny and the Jets, what the fuck is wrong with you? Ah, oh, but they're weird and they're wonderful. b b, -b benny and the Jets. do 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 ch ch do 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 <laughs> Hey, kids, what the hell have you done? Uncle Eno, I guess it will make the race much beautiful. Okay, enough of all that. Um... So, and this talks, Gunny is like reminiscing about the day where he got the flamethrower, which used to belong to the gunnery sergeant in his uh, first platoon ever, and he coveted it. He wanted that flamethrower more than he wanted life himself. Fortunately, uh, the gunnery sergeant uh, there was slain, and Gunny was able to take control of the platoon on his very first mission, and uh, he was a natural. Um, <laughs> Jira says that that's quite obscure. So it's quite obscure to um, us here and now, uh, but I, I bet if we get somebody who was actually like alive in the 70s, right, who was an Elton John fan, right away they'll be like, oh yeah, Yellow Brick Road or whatever. Unfortunately with science fiction, you have a lot of older readers there. So some of them will get that reference, but it's one of those things where it doesn't fucking matter. If you don't get it, it's just flavor text, right? It's just like, oh, I'll just give this. Uh, but if you do get it, it's like, oh, oh I see what you're doing there, Zach. At least that's what I hope. Maybe maybe an editor would be like, get the shit out of here. Nobody cares. Fuck off. So we talk about um, Gunny's first mission. And uh, then uh, we realize that it's present day and Gunny has the flamethrower now. And uh, he is itching for action. But he also realizes he has drawn his flamethrower and he's in a room full of explosive gas. So it's like, oh, fuck me. <laughs> so then we get to chapter 9, verse 23. Um so in chapter 29, Gunny is looking in at the Marines as they're exploring the room. He's required to remain behind. Uh, their protocol is that uh, either Gunny, member, or Bonzo, uh, the pilot, the uh, gunnery sergeant, or the mission recorder has to remain behind when they explore a new room uh, so that they don't all get clapped um, because a mission is pretty much done if all three of those people die. Um, so what he notices is that one of these uh, glass strands has worked its way off of the wall and is like slithering through the air uh, and uh, pointed at the back of member's head uh, like it wants to suck out his brains. And indeed it does. Um, and they get into a fight with these glass tubes uh, that are just supremely strong. And uh, one of them just jabs a Marine, their hammer man named y Mad Yank, uh, right through the forehead. And then it shoots a spark into his skull. And then for a second, he is enlightened. He's like, I can see everything. Uh, but, uh, then he burns up in a column of blue flame that leaves nothing behind but his space suit and his skeleton. Hell yeah. Uh, and then, uh, suddenly the whole room is full of these tubes, like, darting at everybody, trying to, uh, blow up their brains, and the Tards manage to escape from the room, but not before, um, who sacrifices themselves? The rookie, Bickles, uh, sacrifices himself to save the mission recorder, and then goes up in a tricolored column of witch fire blue red and violet hell yeah um so yeah this is where they start to get into the fact that these whales are dangerous the shit in them does not make 
sense. Uh, they like something that looks innocuous as a networking closet is trying to slay them. This is probably a, um, a reflection of my own <laughs> experiences in networking closet. Uh, every networking closet I was ever responsible for was such a shit show. It's just wires going every fucking which away, nothing labeled, uh, things knotted together and so forth. Uh, mouse traps like snipping wires in half and everything. It's just, I'm not an organized guy. <laughs> like more down with organized crime than organized networking closets capiche uh what do we, no i've just been watching too much of the sopranos uh so one of the marines is wounded there sipper and we start to have an oxygen check and we realize that the tards are down to like less than 75 minutes of air with sipper a guy who uh, lost a bunch of his air getting his suit punctured down to less than 60 minutes so that's not good um but sipper even though he's wounded he's still in high hopes um and what else happens in this chapter? Uh, then they realize that they have been sealed off uh, from their uh, transport ship, their rats, and they have to pick between two options, and Lefty thinks both are bad. Mm. Uh, so, <laughs> gender queer flamer. I, I, you know, like, um, so I think it's implied in a few separate places that there's a lot of homosexuality in space right here. Um, I may take some flack for having the, uh, flamethrower be named after Elton John, but, um, if you don't like that kind of joke, this ain't the story for you. You know what I mean? I'm probably not the author for you. Um, yeah, I'm a warrior for social justice, but I have different ideas about what justice is than a lot of people. So, uh, chapter 10, um, is them, uh, uh, hammering their way into another chamber which they, we spent a lot of time on the description of chapter 10, so much time on this yesterday. Um, the uh, chapter 10 is, uh, they enter this gigantic room uh, that uh, appears to be like a 300 meter cylinder, uh, like a, basically they're like inside of a can of cola and they're at the air pocket at the very top and there's a walkway over it and everything. Um, so they start exploring that room and uh, they send the unit Stickman out. A Stickman is like a guy who carries a quiver of like chemical testing rods and crowbars and other like long-handled implements that they need. Uh, so they call him Sticky. Uh, and uh, he, um, the person who's up, is a the dumbest marine in the unit called Heaths. Is supposed to go out and explore this room. He they have like a rotation for who has to scout a new type of room. But uh, Heaths is afraid of water. And uh, underfoot, there's like this black, viscous liquid. Uh, so Heaps is like shitting himself. And yeah, uh, Sticky is like, hey, you know, let me take his rotation spot. And Gunny at first is like, I don't know about all this. Like, you know, Sticky's a lot more valuable than Heaps. Um, but he lets him do it. Uh, and um, uh, Gunny actually notices Heaps just after he uh, checks the teardrop room, kind of just casually tosses his sampling rod aside and he's like hey you know that's a bad fucking habit for a stick man you know just tossing these things and uh and he considers like belting uh sticky in the back of the head but he's like ah eh, you know i'm not gonna do it or whatever sticky's like saws gunny um <laughs> um in space justice is just incredibly concentrated eroticism i like the sound of that right there um it's a punishment i can get behind whoa uh anyhow so sticky ventures out into the center of this long uh thing on a walkway uh and he's taking readings and saying that the air is acidic but he thinks that people can get through and uh then at the end of the center where he says yeah it looks clear to me gunny um he uh, takes a sampling rod and he's just like Wap! <laughs> and throws it into the water uh or it's not actually water it is like um it's like a non-reflective gunk, uh, which we'll get into a little bit better uh, later on. So he just chucks it into the water, and Gunny's like, ah, you know, why didn't I belt him? And he's like, sorry, Gunny. And then boom, uh, this uh, fucking tenderly thing just leaps out of one side of the water over the walkway, just sweeps him into the water. Uh, and at this time, uh, they have uh, they have him connected to a line on a winch. Uh, as he's venturing out there because they're they're well aware that this kind of shit could go down and they try to pull sticky back up but whatever has him is too strong and it winds up uh the whole platoon is like braced against uh their uh linesman winchester 
Uh, but then the line snaps uh, and Sticky is no more. Uh, <coughs> uh, not described in this chapter is how long it took to describe that tube. We spent about three hours working on that description of that tube. But it's a fucking well-described tube at this point. I tell you what, boys. Uh, <laughs> high lead and high acid. So, yeah, we have a pretty good description of this tube right here, which is good because we're, more action is going to take place in this tube. Uh, so they decide that they're just going to retreat and go through the other door. But unfortunately, what they find is that the the uh, the mixture of the two atmospheres in the, um, the shaft full of glass tubes that they were worried about going back through has hardened into like a block of lucite and they can't get through it. Uh, and then as they're checking the other way out of the thing, they realize that the disc is getting super hot and there's potentially a fire on the other side. Because keep in mind, like this whale has been ripped in half. All kinds of shit is broke on this thing. Uh, like, it, like not even things that they broke. So um, they realize that they're gonna have to go through this uh, chamber full of, uh, that has like some monster in it that just uh, ate sticky. Uh, and instead of being like, oh shit, we got to fight the monster. Everybody's kind of looking around and like, yeah, motherfucker. Cause they have been waiting for this. They do not like to go slow and careful. They like to smash and go fast. Uh, and that's, that's like deep in their DNA right there. So this is the point where the reader knows shit is getting real. Uh, okay. So this is them running through that whole thing. Then we get to chapter 11 right here where we talk about how the Navy has been trying so hard to get these guys to stop fucking up and uh, it hasn't worked so far. Um, uh, so they get to a the disc on the other side of this corridor and it, it they can't hammer their way through it at all. So they have to set up a uh, demo charge on it and uh, then they go and take uh, they take uh, shelter uh, must be like almost 150 meters away. Oh, I think the 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 quarter is like um, uh, maybe like 100. Uh, we don't say how long the quarter is, but there's some uh, distance away. But unfortunately, when they blow the door, one, uh, they're unable to get through it because it's uh, it's like like concrete where it's got reinfor a grid of reinforcing bars inside of it. Uh, also, unfortunately, a piece of shrapnel actually takes wing and uh, punctures the air tank of uh, Chapa, their axe man. And it also uh, uh, winds up severing his spine. So uh, Gunny is forced to uh, issue the quietus to uh, Chapa. Uh, Chapa is uh, like, so basically all the Marines have like a, a button on their tanks. Uh, it's like a big yellow uh, F that you can press. It's like under one of those little, little flip up covers, uh, like, like where you hit the bomb on a plane or something like that. Um, and so Gunny presses F and uh, kills Chapa, and uh, Chapa offers up his uh, fire axe, which uh, Gunny then gives to Lefty, who covets it. Uh, so I like I like the like covetousness of the um, space tards with weaponry. I think it's one of the cool character traits of dwarves, which the tards are kind of dwarvy when it really comes down to it. Okay, uh, so now here we are. Uh, that's the whole summary of this thing. So we're at uh, chapter twelve, and I realize that chapter twelve is super long. I was like talking all this shit about this being the final day, but we might need another day to get through this in chapter 13. Whew. Um, let's, uh, let's hop to it. Actually, I need a fucking break after <laughs> I'm going to get up and walk around for like two seconds. You guys uh, gander at these cards because that was a lot of talking to summarize the whole thing. But this is kind of a useful point to uh, get into the whole thing and remember where we were at. I'll be back in like a minute. Mm. <laughs> the end of the season recap yes i don't know like um this is this is like a premise uh this story where i could easily write um several more of these kind of adventures the way that we did with um 
master arcanist and so forth. But uh, it's hard to write like serials of stuff where people just, they're not really into them, you know, like they're like, oh, that's a cool story or whatever. You really need like to drive a serialization or something. You need a significant fan base uh, to keep something like that going. Otherwise, uh, generally, I just try and write a new book. Um, you know, like the, if you're an author that's not like very well known and not very well recognized, I think um, uh, you just keep trying different stuff until you find something, hopefully, that people like. That's been my plan. So far, it hasn't worked. <laughs> oh, losing my fucking voice here. Man, I hope I didn't get paused. I made like a terrible decision last night and went into a fucking McDonald's. Uh, I, was, I was just, I had had it. I had to go out for work and I'm like, I'll just fucking go to a McDonald's. Bad idea. Um, and I'll tell you one thing that I'm seeing is, you know, we're supposed to be doing all this social distancing shit to keep old people from getting whacked, right? But old people are the worst at this shit, man. Like old people like not respecting the little crosses and shit drawn on the floor shuffling around fucking coughing on everybody just and everybody's looking at him like you fucking old piece of shit you know like all of us you know not wearing masks or anything i didn't have a mask either so it's my own fucking fault but uh yeah i mean we're in the epicenter of uh this virus in the united states right here and uh like it's killing like way more black people than anybody else man uh maybe maybe it's like a some uh antibody that they lack or maybe it's like that their healthcare uh, options are limited due to poverty but yeah man like it's not it's not good it's not good all right so let's get into chapter 12 uh so gunny had never seen a living fish or a natural body of water in fact he'd never actually he'd <laughs> uh let's let's uh gunny had never seen a living fish or a natural body of water in fact, he'd never, he'd never seen a single natural thing except the stars themselves. In fact, he'd never seen a natural thing except the stars themselves. Gunny had been hatched on a ship. He would die on a whale. His feet would never touch the ground. Why did that bother him now when it never had before? It had to be something about the ritual of fishing. Baiting the line, casting it, waiting for a bite. Some embedded ancestral memory told Gunny the whole platoon should be drinking grog and relaxing beneath a brilliant blue sky instead of a vast cylindrical mirror. They should be shooting the jit instead of the monster that killed Sticky. So Sticky should be capitalized. Oh, so Spathiwa read a vampire novel on Wattpad. The 11th and final chapter said to go to this link to read the rest of this novel. It was some pay by chapter site, $2 per, $2 per chapter, and it had 110 chapters. That's pretty fucking exploitive, uh, to tell you the truth. I am thinking that um, I should basically, like right now I have all my stories available for free on my site, and I've had them there for like a couple of years, and I'm not getting any traction. Uh, so I think I'm just going to put survival mode uh and maybe hawks of the dine i'll probably put survival mode and uh fucking the right to bear arms as the two free stories uh and the other ones i'm just gonna say you gotta fucking pay or pirate them yourself mm -hmm. that guy rules that's so evil right there i would just go right away um fucking pirate that guy's shit and uh Distribute it on like two hundred and twenty dollars for a shitty fucking vampire story on Wattpad, and I, I will tell you, anybody who has one hundred and ten chapters, I mean, you, you guys saw what it took for me to edit a hundred fucking chapters of Gravid, right? Ridiculously difficult, right? Do you think the vampire guy put in that same time? Uh, uh, uh. -uh. Like I don't, I don't know anything about vampire dude or vampire dudette. Maybe she's fucking amazing and has like a qualified team of editors sitting behind her, but probably that's some unedited dreck. Uh, and it's just, um, yeah, I don't, I don't like the sound of that. That's, that's not how you should treat your readers. Fuck that guy or gal or miscellaneous. <coughs> they should all be shooting the jit instead of the monster that killed Sticky. 
but they were Tards, not Terrans. Their rod was... Uh, okay, so here we need to say fishing rod. Their fishing rod was Yakov's extendable ladder, their line was Winchy's cable, and their bait was Choppa. Triple Trouble were holding up the extendable ladder, jiggling it so that Choppa's limp legs drummed against the black hardened skin on the top of the gunk reservoir. Alright, I don't like gunk reservoir. Triple Trouble were holding up the extendable ladder, jiggling it so that Chapa's limp legs drummed against the crusty black layer of skin that had hardened on top of the lake of gunk. That's, that's too much. Against the skin that had hardened over the layer of gunk. No one objected to using Chapa as bait. He would have loved this. Hell yeah. <coughs> the rest of the platoon was lined up along the edge of the walkway in a firing squad. Bonzo with his dual compensators, his eyes dark and intent. Bonzo stood with his dual compensators ready. His eyes were dark and intent. Yancey held his shredder. His bottom lip sucked under his teeth. Gunny with Benny. Uh. So we're we're swapping Yancey to Had. Um. They uh. Uh, Yancey had his shredder aimed. And so here we um, we swap it so that Gunny is holding Benny right there <coughs> because uh, Gunny is like kind of caressing Benny. And so I'm losing my fucking voice right now. Ah. Uh, yeah, if I get too sick uh, to fucking finish this whole thing, uh, I'm going to give Spathy Wah our finals and so forth. But um, yeah, I don't I don't like that. Although it feels more like a regular cold than uh, fucking whatever else. But yeah, I may. May have that old Rona be annoying. I'm going to take some vitamins and shit. Uh, stop drinking for a little bit. Mm. All right, what do we got here? Wish Sambone were here. Bop gun would blow that black buster to bits, Sipper chirped. Wielding his J&J &J auto shoddy one-handed with his good arm, Gunny narrowed his eyes. Gunny squinted at Sipper. Gunny squinted at Sipper, wondering if he could actually fire the J&J &J without the gun getting away from him. The drum-fed shotgun could cough Teflon-coated uh, uranium faster than Sipper could blink. But Gunny shrugged the thought away. They were done for. Sipper deserved to go down firing. With a heavy whump, a shadow darker than the translucent black crust rammed the fault line beneath Chapa. 
Three times it tried to bust through, and then there was silence. He can't get through, Gunny. Should I need it? Bango asked, sweeping a hand down the bandolier of specialized grenades he was always looking for an excuse to deploy. But Gunny's ears were still ringing from the door charge. Nah, you'll scare it off. Let me give it a love tap. Trips, lift Choppa high so I don't have to roast it, so I don't roast him. Triple Trouble reeled the line, uh, Triple Trouble reeled in the line and Gunny took aim. For a split second after Gunny racked the igniter and squeezed the trigger of the twin jet, Benny made an anticipatory hissing sound, like the flamer was... <laughs> Alright, so we don't need a split second. After Gunny racked the igniter and squeezed the trigger of the, trigger of the twin... Uh, we don't need of the twin jet either. So after Gunny... Yeah, we don't need after either. Gunny racked the igniter and squeezed the trigger. Benny made an anticipatory hissing sound, like the flamer was sucking an air through its teeth in preparation to chew its target out. Then the twin jet roared. Two gouts of beautiful liquid fire jetted out and struck the frozen surface. So I don't, I don't think we can use jetted. Two, je two gouts of beautiful liquid fire licked out and struck the frozen surface. The chemical fire ate through the crust and kept burning. A plume of oily black smoke rose from the pool of flame. From all around him, Gunny could hear Marines ooing at the light show. It was a pleasure to burn. Gunny didn't know it was in the tanks that kept Benny's breath burning bright, but he knew it was nearly impossible to put the twin jets fire out until everything burnable had been consumed. So burnable is a questionable choice right there. <laughs> Let's do could be burned. I don't want flammable, right? It, it's, flammable is like too technical there. It was nearly impossible to put the twin jets fire out until everything that could be burned had been consumed. Only after he pulled the trigger did he realize. As Gunny was hosing flame at the lake of gunk, he realized if the strange fluid ignited, there was a pretty good chance he would incinerate the whole platoon, maybe blow the whole cod clam whale. Again, Gunny shrugged. He'd rather go out with a bang. The flamer did its work. Soon there was a smoldering ring of fire eating its way outward, and they could see black liquid swap slopping at the edges. Dangle him! Let's go! Gunny commanded, and they began to dunk Choppa's body up and down, bobbing him in the dark fluid. The whole platoon was ready to riddle the monster with slugs, bullets, chemical fire, every kind of hurt at their disposal. But nothing took the bait. Benny scared him off, Gunny, Lefty crowed. Chucker's fussy, Gunny said. He hadn't counted on the monster being afraid of fire. Oh, so is YT chat broken again? Ah, fucking... Hold on, are we even... Are we at least streaming to YouTube? Yeah, I don't know why. Sometimes it uh, drops the whole fucking situation. Did I miss any good edits? Yeah, sorry that you have to use Twitch chat. I'm like a fucking savage right there. Um, just let me know if you need to message me on IRC or something like that. <coughs> okay, so the stream's working, just the chats aren't transmitting. I don't know why that happens sometimes, man. Uh, I'm trying to think of where... 
Well, I don't have the uh, YouTube window open. Oh, so Sazas is watching. Sazas Tim. He's watching on. Um... Okay, so Spathy was going to relay some of the edits that we're getting there. Yeah, chat did seem fucking quiet today for some reason. I don't know why. And um, then we can see that earlier, um, adjective noun, uh, his chats are getting relayed. Uh, it's possible that Restream is drawing from top chats, right? So sometimes YouTube um, groups its chats into top chats, which are like high scoring comments. And then anything that includes the N word, it just filters into some separate buffer. Uh, so Restream may draw from like the top chat um, uh, categorization instead of all chats. I doubt it. But um, yeah, oh God. Uh, see, I thought I was doing good and that there were just no edits, but. Um, He hadn't counted on the monster being afraid of fire. Okay. Gunny was racking his brain, trying to think of a way to lure the monster out. As Marines deserve to go out shooting. How dare I accuse you of being a bottom chatter? Wow, yeah, I guess. Well, it was the chats that would fall into uh, bottom chat, not the chatter himself. Um, the weird magenta flame from the teardrop room was getting brighter all the time. Gonna. They were running out of time. From the other end of the pipe, there was a low, thundering drone from the starfish room, like someone was doing it. Yeah, uh, so from the other end of the pipe, there was a low... Th There was a thundering drone from the starfish room, like someone was doing a drum roll on it. <laughs> I like the idea of an enormous gong. <coughs> from the other end of the pipe, there was a thundering drone from the starfish room, like a drum roll performed on an enormous gong. Gunny cleared his mind pushing away the faint mustard taste of death fear, the squirming... I don't... I don't buy that. Yeah, like... I, I think that's... that's a little much. Uh, at the time, they were running out of time. Yeah, that's not good. The weird magenta flame from the teardrop room was getting brighter. They were running out of time. Gunny cleared his mind. His thoughts were jumbled with fussy fear and squirming rage.
Gunny cleared his mind. His thoughts were jumbled with fussy fear and squirming rage, mired in a lonely fog of inevitable death. Something like that. When he was blank, Gunny listened, and in the distance, a filament of memory began to glow. Gunny fought to clear his mind. His thoughts were jumbled with fussy fear and squirming rage, mired in a lonely fog of inevitable death. When he was blank, Gunny listened. Somewhere in the distance, a filament of memory began to glow. A wooga. <laughs> mm. Gunny's face lit up. Hey, Bango. Remember when we watched the enemy below? No, Gunny. I was slept, Bango said automatically, without thought. <laughs> Bango made an excuse without thought. His fingers were running over his bandolier. His eyes were fixated on the hole. Gunny shook his head. They'd seen the movie at least five times. Tards loved anything that had big machines and lots of explosions. A movie with submarines, tanks, or mecha would get played over and over. I knew it. They are weebs all along. Think, Bango. Remember them drums they were rolling off the boat? Trying to blow up that U-boat? Uh... Remember them drums they were rolling off the destroyer, trying to blow up that U-boat? Uh, would U-boat be capitalized? Yeah, I like, I, I want that U. Let, let's find out. Okay, so U-boot, uh, yeah, so it's U-dash-boat. Uh, okay, that's uh, on Wikipedia. Oh yeah, them deck charges. Garoosh! Deck charges, Gunny corrected. How's about we rigs one up? Ain't got no barrels, though, Bango. Ain't got no barrels, though, Bango, Bango griped. Chuck and improvise, Gunny ordered. Bango's left eye shut. His tongue rang under his lips. He peered down at the hole, calculating. We could stuff Choppa's suit with Hayex and drop him in with a fuse going. Gunk's gonna dampen the blast plenty, though. Might, be, might not be enough to skull the beast. How deep you figure this pipe goes? I'm guessing 300 meters. How big a bang can you give that? Oh, Wells, that's deep. Two bars of hex is the biggest I'm supposed to light off at once, Gunny. Only did that once in bango school. Half a click away, I still thought my teeth were going to shatter. Two's the biggest they say to ever light. Yep. Bango trailed away, rolling his eyes up and to the right. Supposing I said bigger, Gunny questioned. I got my backup bar. So do Bonzo and Member. Bango's eyes were suddenly blazing with interest. He'd been waiting his whole life to hear those words. Trunk up, Gunny. Bango's voice dropped to a conspiratorial rumber, rumble, and he offered his trunk. Gunny was surprised, but too intrigued to, re to refuse. Okay, this here is meant to be a secret for Bango's only. Don't tell nobody never. Bango said. You got it, Bango, Gunny promised. Certain he could keep it a secret for another hour until he was dead. Certain he could keep it a secret for another hour until they were all dead. So each of you's... So each of you's three. Pilot, mission recorder, gunnery sergeant. You all get di issued a different flavor of Hyax. Wrappers are different colors because there's different stuff in them. By themselves, they're pretty much just regular hex. But if you know how to mix them, everything is different. It's the big one, Gunny. How big? Dunno. Reaction ain't linear. 
Might pop the whole whale, Bango said. Mm hmm. Yeah, so I want something like breathed. Let's go to the source. <laughs> and then go side with obvious relish. Bango said, <laughs> Yeah, I like the dreamy sigh. Bango cautioned with a dreamy sigh. He was relishing the thought. No chucking way, Gunny protested. Bango leaned in with a grin. Wanna see? Bango leaned in with a grin. Bells, yeah, I do. Make it so, Bango. So shout outs to Picard right there. Bango pulled three silver foiled bars of Hyax out of his satchel. The wrappers always reminded Gunny of chocolate. With his thumb, forefinger, and pinky, Bango indicated Gunny, Bango, and Member at once. Uh, yeah, he doesn't indicate himself. <clears throat> With his thumb, forefinger, and pinky, so this would be like him doing this number right there. <laughs> I love that. Uh, With his thumb, forefinger, and pinky, Bango indicated Gunny, Bonzo, and Member at once. Then he flexed his fingers beckoning. It felt a little like he was casting a spell. Cough up your high X bars, boys. Bango's working some magic here. Okay, so just like object permanence there, they're trunked at that point, and I want to include the description that they'd be trunk. It's like a little tiny thing or whatever, but I just noticed it and I think it um, it's good so that they're not like wondering, are they still fucking clipped together? <coughs> Dutifully, they popped open their, the protective cases on their belts and surrendered the backup Hyax each carried for when Bango inevitably got sculled. Bonzo's wrapper was gold, Gunny's was metallic blue, Member's was a shiny purple. For a dumb moment, Gunny wondered why they gave him blue. He would have preferred purple or gold. Bango, sh Bango shuffled away from the unit, peeling off the wrappers with his back to the others, trying to keep what he was doing a secret. But Gunny could watch him in the reflection of the mirror overhead. But Gunny could watch his reflection on the ceiling. The Hyax bars were the same colors as their wrappers. Bango was deftly stretching them out like taffy, braiding them together into a colorful cord that might be a noose for all of them. When Bango was through, he propped Choppa up and began winding the cord around the helmet above his visor. <coughs> winding the cord around it above, around his helmet, above his visor, like a crown. Oh, uh, we can't do the visor thing. <laughs> I 
Grinning, Bango even formed the top line into crenellated little points. I'm just happy to have the word crenellated in our arsenal right here. It is exactly the right word for uh, what we're doing. It's a real one. Gunny eyeballed the halo of hurt. Getting a last look at the big blue ox painted on the back of Choppa's helmet. Okay, so this is, uh, I have to um, make a note uh, that uh, Choppa has a blue ox on the back of his helmet. I think we gave him something different. Um, I, yeah, I forgot that we had given him that uh, helmet designation. Gunny eyeballed the halo of hurt, getting a last look at the big blue ox painted on the back of Choppa's helmet. He was glad they were all going to go at once so he didn't have to miss anyone else. Gunny ordered Triple Trouble uh, back in two hours. Okay, yeah, I'll see you in a little bit there. How long do we have fucking left here? Uh, I'm not going to be able to make it through the entire thing. So we're going to have one more day. It will not, in fact, be the final, um, but we'll get through this chapter if we can. Gunny ordered Triple Trouble to assist Bango with winching Choppa into the hole, then ordered the rest of the unit to retreat to the platform near the half-blasted disc. Unit, shelter against that busted door. Steer clear of the jaggy part. This one's gonna hurt. Blast shields up. Gunny ought to have ordered blast formation, with the gunnery sergeant, mission recorder, and pilot at the center. Gunny ought to have ordered blast formation, with the gunnery sergeant, mission recorder, and pilot at the center of the, in the center of the huddle and the expendable rifleman at the outside. He didn't give the order. He was through with that jit. The doom didn't need to be fussy. It was his call and he would take the fall. Yeah, triple trouble is the combination of, uh, I think it's like uh, Lefty, Heaves, and Plinko. Um... So it is indeed a, uh, a proper name. It wasn't capitalized. Ooh, let's go back. Oh yeah, they, they, uh, it looks wrong, uh, uncapitalized too. So Gunny ordered the three Triple Trouble Marines to assist Bango with winching Choppa into the hole. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Looking out at the stretch of darkness in the mirrored tunnel, Looking down the mirrored tunnel at the four marines working by the impromptu ladder crane, Gunny suddenly felt an itching sensation he was forgetting something. It was terrible timing. It was a bad time to get that feeling. Ready, Gunny? Bango called out, barely audible over the roar of the flame. Wait, Gunny ordered, figuring out what was bugging him. Winchester. So here, this looks weird, right? Because it's, it's it's a continuation of uh, so it doesn't create a new paragraph. Yeah. 
and spun toward so we're adding that spun towards the linesman thing here um so that we uh put like a little timing uh between uh that action that we're trying to do uh right there uh and uh so that we can put this onto a new paragraph here because i think we need a little bit more tempo while he's like figuring out what's going on and i don't want that to be part of one big paragraph it, it just looks wrong to me um so uh winchester clip everyone into the bars of that door Winchester, clip everyone in, tether to the bars on that door, double time. Add enough slack for the four Marines on the walk to clip in. Add enough slack so those four can clip in too. When Chapa blows, we're going to get swamped. Right oh, Gunny, Winchester, when she blurted, and then he was in a flurry of running line hooking the platoon's donut rings to the bars of the door. Ready, Gunny? Give it 150, Bango. Run over here after and clip in. There was a flurry of activity out on the walkway. Bango primed the bomb crown with three bulb fuses. Then the latter squad winched the dead Marine over the melted hole. <laughs> over the melted hole. Heaves let the cable go, and Choppa dropped, disappearing in a blop of gunk. I love that line, disappearing in a blop of gunk. Perfect. Um, the four Marines dashed up the walkway like madmen, boots clomping as county Gunny counted down from 150. They clipped in and got into the huddle. At 30 count, Gunny gave the order. Blast shields up, eyes shut. A wooga. <laughs> so this is... Uh, was that chapter 12 there? So I think this is chapter 13. So we just, uh, I think our epilogue is pretty short here. We won't make it a chapter title. All right, I, I don't know if you can hear it, but my voice is like, <sighs> I have the fucking virus. So annoying. I mean, I did it to myself, if so. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm running low on voice right here. I think we need to uh, uh, take chapter 13 for tomorrow. But yeah, it's been a pretty good day uh, thus far. I think we're taking it at a good pace. Uh, I did like the recap there, uh, and partly because we fixed a few things in the recap, it reminded me of a couple of things here. So the last thing I'm going to do after the stream, uh, I didn't want to like go through the whole ending and spoil this for you, but I'm going to change uh, the uh, Helmet Herald thing. So uh, just to give you like a progress update, so I already started reaching out to editors for this story, uh, and I got my first quote back. Uh, somebody quoted me $400 uh, to do a copy edit of this story. Uh, I think 400 and and that's uh, I think for this site that's going to be on the low end of the spectrum right there $400 for a copy edit is uh, of 30,000 words feels a little high to me um, so generally like you want to pay a copy editor around um, fucking around $30 an hour uh, is where I like to come in uh, I've paid copy editors it's not a lot lot right it's a little bit I might negotiate with this guy or see if he'll do like a sample chapter or something like that. But, um, uh, yeah, I, I have to tell you, like, it's more than I want to pay. Like I would have, I don't think I would have blinked at $300, but 400 is a lot. Um, to tell you the truth. And, and I think, I think it should take about 10 hours to copy edit this story. Uh, if you look at what it's taken me right here, we're going to be day eight or nine. So the initial edit here, where we're doing rewriting and shit like that, we've pro I've probably spent about 30 hours on this, um, all told. Although we'll, we'll see like what the length of um, these streams are when we put them in a playlist. But I think I think we'll wind up spending between like 25 and 30 hours on on this whole edit. And I think a professional copy editor who is not doing rewriting and who's not like recapping the story or like furrowing his brow or whatever should be able to get this done in about 10 hours. Um, so Jira says that, uh, it's hard to negotiate down work like that and you might get worse work, which is like a very perceptive thing. That's definitely been, uh, my experience working with editors when, cause usually with any kind of service like that, they're highballing you cause they expect you to negotiate and so forth. 
But there's also that that kind of like, oh, this guy's not really like paying me what I need to. And this is work where you need somebody's full concentration. They have to like the work that they're working on to do their best work. They have to believe in it. And they really have to give you 100% of their mind uh, for that time. That's why it used to be that I would pay copy editors about $20 an hour. But I don't, I don't think that you can really do that and get the caliber of editing that I want. Uh, so I'm, I'm willing to go to like 30, but, um, I, I think it's $400 is a little high for this guy. If you are involved in publishing and I'm like way the fuck off base here, let me know. But that's just my gut feeling. So I'll see if other people respond. Uh, I, I reached out to like four different editors and I'll see if any of these others, uh, respond. I'm, I'm looking at some other editing services and so forth, but I do think it's important that if we're going to put something out, we're going to, so we're going to publish, uh, space tards. As a novella, it'll be about the same size as, I think it's about as long as um, uh, The Master Arcanist, uh, I think. Um, hold on, we can just, uh, what's the word count for Arcanist? I'll look into it later. Uh, I don't want to look at it on stream at the moment there, but um, yeah, so I mean, this is, this is part of the whole thing. And what I have to look into there, um, uh, and maybe like, Fortunately, this is the end of the thing. So if it's not interesting, it's not the end of the world. Um, so I'd like to do a few different things uh, with space tards. Like I would love, I'm looking into this on Fiverr, uh, seeing if I can find like a tattoo artist or a sketch artist or somebody like that who will take uh, the helmet heralds for each of these guys and do just like a little like black and white sketch, like this fucking t-shirt or something like that. Like a black and white, doesn't have to be super fancy, tattoo style sketch. Um, and then I'd love for, uh, each of the chapters, uh, one through 13 to have, uh, like, um, just an image of that, uh, Marine's helmet herald. I think that would be like super cool, right? That would, that would do a lot for me in the story. Uh, and then also I want to potentially, uh, license some, uh, cover art for this guy. Uh, I would love to have, uh, like some fucking space Marines exploring. I would I, really, what I would love is to, uh, hire, uh, the guy that did the cover for survival mode. Who I think did just like a, a an incredible uh, job on like a super campy uh, cover. I'd like to hire that guy, um, but I think that's another four hundred dollars. So if we spend um, eight hundred dollars on putting this book out, um, like essentially when you sell a book on Amazon, uh, I think the cheapest that I could put something out at is probably like three or four dollars or something like that to make a dollar on each book. Maybe maybe it has to be like five dollars a book, right? So at $5 a pop, um, I would need to break even on this. I would need to sell a few hundred copies of this book. Uh, and I just, I don't think, I think it would take like at least a year to sell a hundred copies of this guy. Um, then afterward, like anything you make, is just fucking gravy. Right. But, um, generally, um, like I would have to really come up with some kind of a marketing plan and then you have to do, um, then you have to, like, if you want to make that thousand dollars back or whatever, probably we'd need to spend like another $200 in AdWords and so forth. The other part of this is that, um, I'm not, I'm not like really willing to flex on that title. I think it's important that it be called space tards. Uh, I, th I like that title. I like uh, the fact that it's tongue in cheek, that we make no bones about the fact that, uh, these guys are retarded, but they're also space Marines and they're heroic. Um, and I like a lot of the like tongue in cheek humor that we've got happening here. So, um, yeah, well, we'll have to fucking see, uh, what we do of it, but yeah, just to give you an idea of some of the numbers behind this whole thing, like I, I'd be very surprised if I put this out and sold more than like 20 copies in the first month without like some kind of marketing campaign or without, um, finding some people to plug it and so forth. And it's almost like a full-time job trying to get people to, re um, trying to get people to like review stuff and so forth. You have to send out so many query letters. Oh, all right. My voice is done. So yeah, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, sorry that I said that this would be the final day, but tomorrow will finally be the final day, uh, assuming that I don't lose my voice.